tonight, a twist in the AFL's testing tale. A negative coronavirus result now for Essendon's Connor McKenna. But Victoria's numbers continue to rise as the battle to prevent a second wave gets serious. It doesn't matter how many people are doing the wrong thing, everybody, everybody will pay the price. Also tonight, three women now planning to sue a former High Court judge over alleged sexual harassment. And the most powerful supercomputer in the Southern Hemisphere is unveiled in Canberra. Good evening, Mary Geeran with ABC News. In developing news tonight, Essendon's Connor McKenna, the first AFL player to test positive for coronavirus just days ago, has confirmed to the ABC that his latest test has come up negative. That surprising turn comes as Victoria recorded a double-digit rise in cases for the seventh day in a row. Two Melbourne primary schools and a childcare centre have closed after positive tests. And an army of public health workers is preparing to go door to door in virus hotspots to remind people of the risks. State political reporter Bridget Rollison begins our coverage. A virus testing traffic jam. Some forced to wait up to four hours, others told to come back another day. Fears of a second wave have jolted some Victorians into action. Nearly 18,000 were tested yesterday. If people keep pretending that this is over, just because that's what they desperately want, and I understand that, we will finish up with a second wave. 11 of today's 17 new cases came from an unknown source. A family of five in Maribyrnong has tested positive, while a cluster linked to a Keelor Downs family has spread to 13 people across eight households. One of those family members worked at the Coles Distribution Centre in Laverton, which is continuing to operate with strict physical distancing. The amount of community transmission that we've got is too high. We've got a really good handle on where it's coming from, and it is principally uh, families, uh, larger families often, uh, making decisions that are not in accordance with the rules. Hundreds of public health workers will hit the streets this week, door knocking non-English speaking households. You can always do more, but I think it's a start. I think getting people out and talking to those communities and in, in link at languages other than English. Today, an Essendon childcare centre and two more primary schools were closed for cleaning after children tested positive for the virus. With school holidays coming up and generally, if you are unwell, don't go out, don't have play dates, don't have family events, don't go to work. Epidemiologists say a total lockdown should be considered. There's a lot more that could be done with those suburbs, for example. At the moment, people are just dissuaded from going to work out of those suburbs. That could be amped up and people are actually required to stay at home. That remains an option, but I am hopeful that with this level of testing and this level of awareness that we will be able to uh, uh, control and suppress those cases. The Victorian government is holding off on further lockdowns, but the numbers might soon force their hand. But the problem is, whatever measures they do take, they won't know if they're effective until at least 10 days' time because of the virus's incubation period. With no time to waste, South Australia is sending reinforcements to help with contract tracing in Victoria. We're just there to supplement that team um, because uh, they have more cases than we do. While New South Wales is encouraging its people to stay away. I call on all organisations not, not to interact um, with citizens from Melbourne at this stage. Bridget Rollison, ABC News. And turning back now to that bizarre twist for the AFL, Bombers player Connor McKenna has tonight confirmed he's tested negative to the virus just days after a positive result that scuppered Sunday's match against Melbourne. Let's bring in Catherine Murphy now. Catherine, can you tell us what's happened? What a day it's been. Good evening, Mary. As you said, Connor McKenna has tested negative to COVID-19. That's after he tested positive on Saturday, had an irregular test on Friday. And before that, Mary, he tested negative 
five times since his return from Ireland. As I stand here and talk to you this evening, he is negative. Now, Connor has spoke to me earlier and obviously he's very surprised. It's been a really tough week for Connor and a very up and down week, but he's a really funny guy. He's a very laid back guy. He is seeing the humour in all of this, Mary. I think he has to. He's taking the laugh or you'll cry approach to 2020 because this is an incredible unfolding story. I think that's a wise attitude. So, Catherine, have we heard anything from the AFL about what this now means for the schedule? Well, I've just spoken to the AFL and they said they can't make a decision until Connor tests negative twice. So that means he will undergo further testing tomorrow. He needs to test negative twice before they make a decision. Now, this has wider implications because, of course, today, Connor's teammate, James Stewart, was told he needed to go into quarantine for 14 days because he was a close contact of Connor's at Essendon training. That rules him out for two matches not just Connor, so it implicates him as well. We'll have to wait and see what this negative result means for James Stewart. Of course, we know that the Essendon versus Carlton match is going ahead. It's just a matter of where, whether James and Connor will be available. We'll have to wait and see if Connor tests negative again tomorrow. I know that Connor spent a lot of today ordering delicious food for two weeks because he can't leave the house, and he's very concerned. He doesn't know if he'll need that right now, Mary. <laughs> Hopefully it can still come in handy. Catherine Murphy, thank you. Thank you. Well, the World Health Organisation has urged countries to do more to fight the spread of coronavirus as the global death toll approaches half a million. The number of cases around the world is now more than nine million. It took more than three months to reach one million infections, but the last million cases have come in just eight days. The greatest threat we face now is not the virus itself. It's the lack of global solidarity and global leadership. We cannot defeat this pandemic with a divided world. The WHO says there are worrying surges in Latin America, but countries like the US and UK need to take care as they reopen their economies. Europe correspondent Linton Besser reports. The pain of loss in Brazil. Every day they need more than a thousand new graves. So many people have died that coffins have to be stacked on top of each other. The shocking figure just released 54,000 new coronavirus cases in a single day. One in three people being tested is positive. But there's not a lot of testing, so the number of cases could be far worse. In the US, on the outskirts of Washington, health workers are scrambling to find new beds and are frustrated many people don't believe there's a real threat. Everybody is out lounging on the beaches and just thinking that it's over, and it's not. Unfortunately, it is those people that keep, will keep this pandemic going. More Americans have now died from coronavirus than in the First World War. But in New York, until recently a global hotspot, life is starting to return to normal. People are shopping, eating at outdoor cafes and getting their hair done. The concern now is states in the south like Texas, Georgia and Florida. The number of new cases is more than 26,000 a day. India now has Asia's worst outbreak. Almost half a million have been infected in this country alone. The healthcare system has been slammed. But in Europe, there are hopes they're through the worst. Spain is opening its borders to get tourism going. And Britain is about to announce major changes. It's hoped cinemas, pubs, museums and hotels will reopen in early July. It's going to be the riskiest move Boris Johnson has made so far in easing Britain out of lockdown. He's also expected to change the social distancing rule from two metres to one metre, all in a bid to boost economic activity. Linton Besser, ABC News, London. 
Three former High Court associates have announced plans to sue former Justice Dyson Hayden for alleged sexual harassment. An internal investigation by the High Court that upheld complaints from six women has prompted calls for the legal profession to take the issue more seriously. But time limits on lodging civil complaints mean the women are in for a long wait on the courts for a decision. Elizabeth Byrne reports. They were the best and the brightest, but their brilliant careers were cut short. A statement issued by the High Court revealed an independent investigation found six young associates had been sexually harassed by former Justice Dyson Hayden. My clients will be pursuing compensation both from the Commonwealth and from Dyson Hayden. The development has prompted calls for Mr Hayden to be stripped of his Order of Australia. Are Australian honours given to everyone except those who are convicted in court. There should be a proper process to deal with this. There will be. They're very serious allegations. They're very concerning and very disturbing. Uh, and on that basis, um, I would expect those processes to do their job. Chief Justice Susan Kiefel has apologised to the women and adopted recommendations including to review induction processes, establish a support person for associates and make clear to associates that their duties do not include an obligation to attend social functions. I think that the things that she has suggested that the High Court will be doing should be replicated um, in courts across the, the country if they're not already. Adrian Morton says the inquiry result is a wake-up call for the profession, where the result of complaining for young female lawyers can be career-ending. But it's not just junior lawyers. Former ACT Law Society President Nor Bloomer has her own story about allegedly being groped by Dyson Hayden at the University of Canberra Law Ball in 2013. She made a lengthy note at the time and complained to the university, which has confirmed the communication with the ABC. But even she didn't want to press it further. The reason that uh, these matters weren't aired or weren't haven't been pursued uh, to this point, uh, and that is a visceral fear of Dyson Hayden's power. The three women taking legal action have now all left the law. This has been um, a secret for so long. This has had a huge impact on their lives. Um, there is still sadness um, amongst my clients about the loss of their careers. Dyson Hayden's lawyers have told the Sydney Morning Herald he denies any allegation of predatory behaviour and if he's caused offence, it was unintended and he apologises. Elizabeth Byrne, ABC News, Canberra. The Lawyer X Royal Commission has been given more power to decide what details it will make public about the legal scandal. Details about the deals that gangland hitmen and drug dealers made with Victoria Police have been kept secret for years. But today, the Court of Appeal has agreed that more than 50 historical suppression orders can be changed after the inquiry argued they were hindering its work. The Commission has been investigating Victoria Police's use of gangland lawyer Nicola Gobbo as a police informer. Its final report is due in November. Homicide detectives are investigating the death of a man at a campground in Gippsland in the state's east on Sunday. Police say the 49-year-old Springvale man was assaulted by other campers at Tarongo Falls on Friday night. It's believed the incident may have been sparked by an argument over the man's dog. Detectives say the man initially refused medical assistance, but his condition deteriorated on Sunday night. The ambulance is called, he's uh, placed in the ambulance and dies en route to hospital on Sunday night. Police are seeking help from any campers who were at Tarongo Falls last week or anyone who may have seen him at the nearby Nuji Hotel. The perception that young people in country areas are all itching for life in the big city is being challenged by a new report. Data from the past five years up to the last census shows regional areas attracted 65,000 more people from capital cities than it lost to them. Sydney, Melbourne and Adelaide all saw net migration to the regions while the rest of the capital cities gained people. The Gold Coast was the most popular regional area people moved to, with other cities like Newcastle and Greater Geelong also featuring in the top ten. 
but it's the millennial movers, those between 20 and 35 years old, that towns are most keen to attract, as national regional correspondent Dominique Schwartz explains. Mine worker Alan Mann used to touch down at home for only a week at a time. Dropping him off to the airport up in Townsville when we were doing fly in, fly out, they would be all crying in the back of the car. So the family traded FIFO work in Queensland for daily mine work near Orange and are now looking to put down roots in central western New South Wales. At 28 and 29, the couple are millennials, a prized demographic for country towns. They're younger, they're enthusiastic, they're often in the early stages of family formations. They'll make deep roots in those communities and stay on for a long time. The report by the Regional Australia Institute found that in the five years to 2016, more millennials swapped regional life for capital city living than vice versa, but a bigger number relocated from one region to another. The largest numbers of millennials were moving to places with good urban and social infrastructure and good career prospects. Large regional centres like Queensland's Gold Coast were most popular. But smaller mining communities were also attractive, particularly in Western Australia. Sydney was the only capital to shed more millennials to the regions than it gained. History teacher Tom Fennell was one of them. I just wanted to go to a country town that was big enough that would be able to support everything I needed um, and I've found it in Orange, I'm very happy. Home to 40,000 people, Orange has an airport, a hospital and a university. <laughs> Three key draw cards for millennials, the report says. Having bought a home with his fiancée, Tom plans to stick around. I plan to stay here hopefully my whole life and never move again. The lights of regional Australia are bright enough. Dominique Schwartz, ABC News. Still to come this hour, why this recession will hit your retirement plans. We were looking at retiring probably when I hit 70. Our restaurants became worth nothing. For a person looking to retire at the moment, you are the person that really is going to feel it the most. Also, meet one of the people caught up in the nation's latest COVID spike. That's coming up. Animal rights groups say the illegal trade of endangered and protected songbirds is increasing due to the pandemic. Millions of the birds caught by poachers in the Indonesian wild every year are entered into singing competitions that are growing in popularity since moving online. Indonesia correspondent Anne Barker reports. This is how poachers steal rare and protected birds in Indonesia. In native forests, they begin by smearing glue along a tree branch. A phone hidden nearby plays a bird call as bait. Soon, an unsuspecting bird is trapped and destined for a new life in a cage. I feel so sad seeing our birds lost every year from smuggling and being unable to do anything. Most birds stolen from the wild are smuggled to Java where they're prized not for their feathers but their song. Birds like the Murai Batu or white rumped Sharma are regularly entered in singing competitions. The pandemic has shut down thousands of competitions like this, but it hasn't stopped the illegal trade. The contests have moved online, fueling even higher demand. The popularity of bird singing competitions has just skyrocketed. And in April, we started seeing the launch of virtual online bird singing competitions. Animal rights groups want authorities and companies like Facebook to do more to stop the trade, though they say corrupt officials are part of the problem too. Quarantine officials have recently cracked down on bird smugglers and last month intercepted thousands of birds smuggled from Sumatra in buses. Five people were jailed. <laughs> We found nearly 3,000 birds of various types without proper documents. The perpetrators don't care about the size of the cage. They're not fit for the birds. As restrictions now ease, authorities predict poachers will soon return to the forests. Anne Barker, ABC News. 
Well, it was a dark day in Queensland's history when fire ripped through the Palace Backpackers Hostel at Childers, killing 15 young backpackers. And today marks 20 years since the blaze. As survivors and the community reflect on the tragedy, the man responsible for the deaths is waiting to hear whether he'll soon be released from jail. Now married with two children and living their dream on a farm in Victoria, Moffat and Stacey Nartai have overcome, but not forgotten, the trauma of one of the worst fires in Queensland's history. It gets close to the anniversary, you start thinking about it, and then emotions start. 20 years ago, they left New Zealand young and carefree and landed jobs on farms in Childers. They were sleeping upstairs at the Palace Backpackers Hostel when it was set alight. Miraculously, they survived the inferno. You could see the flames going out the bottom windows and basically like sort of being sucked back up to the top windows. Um, and, yeah, it was just horrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's a sight you'd never want to experience. Fifteen people were killed. Most were young travellers from overseas. Police officer Jeff Fay remembers getting the call that night. It was clearly evident that, uh, yeah, that some people hadn't made it out. So we, we knew early on in the piece that, uh, that yeah, that, that was, was, was a tragedy. It was also clear the fire was deliberately lit and after a five-day search, Robert Paul Long was found hiding in bushland in the nearby town of Howard. Despite 15 young lives lost, Long was only charged and convicted of the murders of Australian twins Kelly and Stacey Slark. He's now seeking parole for the crime. He shouldn't be given a chance to get out. He needs to pay for what the others are suffering. Today, the community of Childers gathered to pay their respects to those lost. It's 20 years, but sometimes it seems like yesterday, and those pains just don't go away. The whole community, they opened themselves up for us and made themselves vulnerable and took on the burden of our grief. There were plans for a major memorial service here today, but they were cancelled because of COVID-19. Nevertheless, the community says it's important to mark the anniversary because the tragedy had such an impact on the small town. A common bond born out of tragedy. Johanna Marie, ABC News, Childers. A new supercomputer in Canberra is only six months old and has already done 40 million hours of research on COVID-19. The computer is called Gardi, an Indigenous word meaning to search for. And overnight it was ranked the 25th most pow powerful computer on the planet. The scale of the Southern Hemisphere's biggest supercomputer defies belief. And overnight it was named among the most powerful on the planet. To have it all come together and uh, see it land at number 25 is just super exciting for us. It's as powerful as 60,000 desktop computers, uses roughly the same power as a small suburb, and the information it stores is equivalent to every book published in every language in the past 500 years. The Gardi machine does simply unimaginably enormous calculations. Recent analysis of weather patterns surrounding 2017's deadly cyclone Debbie gave insight into its impact on national weather systems. Which then allows us to predict what's going to happen next time around when we get in a similar situation. It can also offer real-time analysis of bushfires and give firefighters on the front line invaluable details of fire behaviour. Being able to drill down to you know, resolution on the order of 100 metres or so is absolutely critical to predict where's the fire going, where's the front going to go next. As COVID-19 gripped the planet, the national computational infrastructure was already turning the power of its supercomputer towards the virus, seeking to understand it while searching for ways to limit its spread and find a cure. And allocated 40 million hours of compute time across three projects which are flying now. That's equivalent to a single computer working non-stop on calculations for 4,500 years. Researchers are hopeful of a breakthrough that could have global implications on the virus. Dan Borsha, ABC News, Canberra.
The answer is always 42. To more numbers now with finance and the local market was slightly higher today but AMP soared after getting the green light to sell its life insurance business. Here's Alan Kohler. AMP announced it was selling out of life insurance in October 2018 for $3.3 billion, later revised down to $3 billion. But the deal's been held up while regulators stroke their chins. In a three-line announcement today, AMP said all approvals have now been received and investors suddenly saw the words special dividend float before their eyes and they drove the share price up nearly 8%, although they won't know for a week or so whether they'll get any of that cash. Apart from that, the share market drifted higher today with most of the banks down and retailers up quite a lot. And that followed a rise on Wall Street last night and on Asian markets this afternoon. Oil went up and iron ore went down on commodity markets and the Australian dollar has popped back above 69 US cents. Now, with tonight's graphs, there's good news and bad news. First, the good news. This is a flash output survey from the Commonwealth Bank, which gives an early reading on the economy, and it suggests that it's already growing again, albeit off a lower base. And ANZ Bank's early data from its customer accounts suggests that retail spending has stabilised at a very strong level, well above what it was before the pandemic. The bad news is to do with employment. This chart shows total hours worked per capita and it's well below what it was in the last two recessions, 1991 and 1982. And finally, here's the consensus forecasts of economists for Australian and global GDP this year. Now, it's currently down to 4.5% contraction in Australia and 3.7% for the world. And in both cases, that's the deepest since the 1930s. And that's finance. The Collingwood Football Club has launched a formal investigation into renewed allegations of racism by former player Haritie Lumumba earlier this month. Lumumba called on the Magpies and the AFL to acknowledge that his experiences of racism at the club were inadequately dealt with. Lumumba says there was a culture of racist jokes and he was given a racist nickname during his 10-year career with the Pies. He also says he was ostracised by the club when he publicly criticised its president, Eddie Maguire, over comments he made about Adam Goods in 2013. Collingwood has referred the matter to its Internal Integrity Committee and says it's a serious issue that requires action. A shot worth two goals will be introduced in the Super Netball competition in August, even though a recent fan survey was strongly against the move. Former Australian goal shooter Caitlin Thwaites was among several players to express concern on social media, saying it was terrible the players weren't consulted, but Super Netball refutes this. The rule will be in play for the last five minutes of each quarter, where players will be awarded two goals if they shoot successfully from a designated zone within the goal circle. This was as good a time as any to bring it in and to make sure that we were pushing ourselves and pushing our boundaries to create excitement, new fans, evolve the game and ensure that we're securing the growth of the league. The super shot will also be active during the five minute extra time period, which will take place if the game is tied. And now it's time for the weather. Here's James Hancock. Hey Mary, another foggy start to the day, but the patches cleared, leaving mostly cloudy skies. The coldest it got overnight was minus three at Falls Creek, but Port Ferry and Portland in the southwest only dropped to 11. Most districts saw showers in the last couple of days except for East Gippsland. 26 millimetres fell down at Wilson's Prom and further north at Lang Lang. Most spots in the state south got less than two millimetres today. Wind gusts up to 94 kilometres an hour swept through Mount William in the Grampians this morning. It was sunny in the west this afternoon, but the cloudy skies kept maximums below average. Our low of nine came in the early hours of the morning, rising to 14 degrees around lunchtime. Two millimetres of rain was collected in the city gauge. Emergency services have been kept busy around Hobart. Heavy rain, about 60 millimetres over three days, causing damage to homes. The rain is being caused by a complex low pressure system over the Tasman Sea. It's pushing cold air and clouds over Tasmania and Victoria. The Bureau says a high pressure ridge will extend over Victoria tomorrow night. A cold front that's crossing the Southern Ocean will clip the state south on Thursday. The next high will move over the state on Friday and Saturday. Rain easing in Hobart tomorrow and a possible early shower over in Perth.
There should be isolated showers tomorrow, mostly over the south and west of the state, scattered over Gippsland and falling as snow on the Alpine peaks. In the state's west, areas of morning fog tomorrow, cloudy for most districts, there's also a chance of showers. In the east, it's looking cloudy and foggy too, a high chance of showers for East Gippsland. On the bays, winds will be southwesterly, 10 to 15 knots, turning south to southeasterly below 10 knots early in the morning, then becoming variable later. Partly cloudy tonight in Melbourne, the Bureau saying a 60% chance of showers for our northeastern suburbs, a slight chance elsewhere. We could see fog tonight. The fog's expected to hang around tomorrow morning. It'll be cloudy, 10 to 16 degrees. The forecast for Thursday is a shower or two. There's a chance of early fog, 9 to 17. Friday, partly cloudy and 14 degrees. Mary. Thanks, James. And Lee Sowers is next.